Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're new here or watching online, my name is Stan Coleman, and I am so incredibly privileged to be the lead pastor of this amazing place of grace we call West Cobb Church, especially if you're a first time or a second time attender. Uh, we're delighted that you chose to be in this conversation. I believe God brought you here today. I believe God has more for you, and I'm, I'm believing that you'll discover a little more today about why you chose to come and God brought you here. If you're just now joining us, hundreds of us just culminated an amazing spiritual journey we called West Cobb United, where we came together around the mission of the gospel and the unity, and we discovered, and can I just tell you, I'm so thankful for hundreds and hundreds of you who were not only a part of the conversation, but you did life together in groups. I'm thankful for all of our West Cobb United group leaders. We believe that Jesus best model life in groups and life is better in groups that we're more effective together, we're more efficient together, we're quite simply better together in groups. I love how God is bringing people from all walks of life from different neighborhoods, different communities, different religious backgrounds or persuasions, different ethnicities, and how God's people are coming together, how good and pleasant it is when God's people are on mission together in unity. Well, as we look at the calendar, here we begin the first Sunday in April, and it's almost hard to believe we're now less than two weeks away from Easter weekend at West Cobb, which is, in our granddaughter Ella's favorite word, going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be off the hook. You name it. It's going to be an incredible weekend. Why? Because we believe that because of what happened that first Easter, everything's going to change for somebody who's going to be here on Easter weekend. And yet, I've got a huge problem problem in my life. I have a problem, and I've had this problem ever since I was a teenager in church. I'll get back to that in just a few moments, because it has to do with what we're calling, what I chose to call best kept secret. Best kept secret, pastor. I'm not talking about dirty little secrets. That's a different conversation. I'm not talking about Victoria's secret. That's a whole nother venue that we could uh, discuss. But I'm talking about something that began to bother me even when I was 17 years old as a senior in high school. And it happened to me in and through the local church. And it bothers me to this day. So I first went to Webster to uh, find out exactly what the word secret really meant. And here is what he said, something that is kept or meant to be kept unknown or unseen by others. If you go back with me for just a moment, I was a senior in high school when I believe the Lord gave me a dream late one night. It felt a little more like a nightmare at times, but I believe God gave it to me. One by one, I saw my friends and my classmates make their way to the edge of a cliff sort of to look over the edge of the cliff at this proverbial lake of fire and brimstone, if you will. Each one of them would look back at me as if to say, Stan, you knew the good news. You had discovered the good news of Jesus as your forgiver, your leader, your savior, your Lord, and you never, ever told me about it. And then I would see them walk off this cliff into their eternal future without the hope that I had, the purpose that God had given me in my life. And I still remember, it was decades and decades ago, I remember waking up, I was sweating profusely, and I made a commitment as best I knew how, as I was going to end my senior year students, that each and every friend and classmate, as God gave me an opportunity, uh, guys that I played basketball with, girls that I met at the senior play, whoever it might be, the best I know how I could share, here's what Jesus did for me, and he can do something for you as well. I still remember that weekend I went to church. And uh, just so you know, when I was growing up, I went to mostly Southern Baptist churches. My parents uh, were not raised in church, but they came to faith in Christ. And my dad eventually became a deacon and my mom a Sunday school teacher. And we moved across town and we attended what was at that time one of the most spirit-filled Southern Baptist churches in the state of Texas. Those two are not incongruent. You can have a spirit-filled Baptist church, just so you know. And my, my pastor at the time was a guy named Jack Taylor. Jack Taylor at the time wrote the number one best-selling Christian book called The Key to Triumphant Living, The Secret to Triumphant Living. 
And he was my pastor, and his son, Tim, was one of my best friends. Well, I had just left Sunday school with Al Voss. How many of you, and you're going to be honest, your church don't, okay. How many of you went to Sunday school as a kid growing up? Lift your hands if you went to Sunday school. All right, great. We call them groups around here. It's, it's changed a little bit. And so I had just left Sunday school, and I, I got to the back of the worship center. And for the first time ever, I think, having had that dream, I noticed something. I noticed that there was a, a large grouping of people, the faces, I knew these people for a number of years we'd been going to that church, that they had no passion for the Lord, they had no urgency for the gospel that God had just given me that urgency, that intensity. They sort of would you know, fold their arms as we sang these incredible songs. They wouldn't lean into the conversation. And I thought, man, here are these people who some of them have been Christians 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and Somehow they've lost their flavor. They've lost their energy. They, they've lost their passion. They've lost their excitement. And I said, God, I don't, I don't ever want to be that person in my life. There's something wrong. Something even began to bother me, even as a senior in high school. And so I, I just made a commitment at that time that I understood that this is not the way that Jesus laid it out. It's not what he intended his church or his disciples to be about this best kept secret. If we go back in time to the one whom we find, found and follow, Jesus, one day Jesus is on a hillside where he taught. Primarily, he was teaching his disciples, but hundreds of people were listening in that day. It was called the, it's now been called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is getting ready to reveal God's marvelous plan and kind of how the gospel would work in their day and then in our day. And he says, and this is recorded by a guy named Matthew. Matthew is a former tax collector. That's a no good person. And uh, he, his whole life was radically changed by Jesus. And he became a follower of this rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth. He then became a fisher of men and he threw parties for his lost friends to find Jesus. His name was Matthew, a disciple of Jesus. And so uh, Matthew records the words of Jesus. Now I want, you to, I want you to watch for two seven word statements that Jesus made that will penetrate your heart today. You, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And if you can read Jesus' lips here, you will discover these are not commands in the original language. These are statements of truth, uh, this is who I made you to be, church. Disciples, this is what you're supposed to be about the business of. This is what you're supposed to be doing. He doesn't say, you try to be salty, or you need to be saltier. He doesn't say, you better light up your world, you better shine your light, or people are gonna trip in the dark. No, Jesus says to his disciples, this is who you are. This is who I made you to be. You are salt, and if you think about salt, salt penetrates and it purifies and it preserves. You are the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. What does light do? It dispels the darkness. It shines into the dark recesses of people's lives. And Jesus indicates this is who you are, church. This is what you're supposed to be about the business of. He says, you're the salt of the earth. Watch this. So don't ever lose your saltiness because that's the way people taste of me. He says, you are the light of the world. Why? Because a city set on a hill, it, it cannot be hid. There's no way you can hide a city set on a hill. So don't hide your light under a bucket or a bushel, if you will, or a basket. West Cobb Church, quite simply, Jesus is teaching that the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be salt and light in the community where it is, both locally and globally around the world. And so the question becomes, these two seven-word statements, are we being the salt of the earth, or have we lost our saltiness, and are we being the light of the world, and have we covered it up a little here and there? Something uh, that I want to also mention is that after I looked up the word secret, I looked up the phrase best kept secret. Here's the way Webster defines best kept secret. Something very good that not many people know about. West Cobb Church, we have something very good. I would contend, even in the Bible Belt, not very many people really and truly know about the secret that we're going to unveil today. Now, they may know about the church. I mean, there's so many churches on so many corners in our communities. But just because you know about the church 
Uh, by the way, I have met the last two years scores and scores of people along Ernest Barrett Parkway and Dallas Highway in Powder Springs and Marietta and I continue to meet people that have no clue that West Cobb Church exists or where we're located. Now, you, you need to know, I've been teaching, if you're new here, that the church is not primarily a building, that the church is us. We're a family on this mission. We're, we're in the movement called the Gospel of Grace. And so uh, the church is not primarily a building, but we've chosen, have we not, to uh, gather together in this place of grace called West Cobb Church, which is also gathering together corporately as a church for teaching, for transformation, for worship, and for creating environments for children and students and others to find and follow Jesus. And so uh, as, as we do this, the thing that I have discovered, and, and some of you know this, and some of it may, bo may bother some of you like it does me, but I've met these people who used to go to church, so they're de church, or they went to vacation Bible school, or their father was a deacon, or their mother was a Sunday school teacher, or they even went to camp as a kid. But if you really dig down deep, they never really discovered the secret that was unveiled 2,000 years ago. They've tried religion, but they've never really had a personal, intimate, abiding relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but it bothers me when I heard that 86% of Paulding and Cobb County, on a Sunday morning, they do not go to a Bible-believing, Jesus kind of evangelical church. And so therefore, it's become the best-kept secret. Secret stand? What's, what's the secret that, that you're referring to from 2,000 years ago? I want you to walk with me for just a moment. This guy's name is Saul. Saul is a persecutor of the church. He is very religious, but he also persecutes the church, which is kind of weird. And so Saul is going his own way. He is uh, running from God. He is uh, into religion. He's a Pharisee among Pharisees, and he has uh, Christians killed. And God literally knocks him off his horse. God has a way of doing that, especially with men. I'm gonna knock you off your horse and, and, and you're gonna have a, a moment of weakness and brokenness so that you can see the light of the gospel. And so in doing so, he repents and believes in Jesus. His life is radically changed. And now Saul becomes who is now the apostle Paul. And later he writes a book, a letter, to some believers who are struggling with life like some of us are struggling with life. And he says, I want you to know the secret that I discovered. And so thankfully, we have that for us today, found in the book of Colossians. And, in, in, and through the message translation of the Bible, let me just read it for you. The, this secret has been kept in the dark for a long time, but now, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The secret in a nutshell is just this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. This is the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic, Christ. No more no less. That's what Paul's words, that's what I'm working so hard at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. Friends, the secret to Christianity, according to the Bible, according to Paul, the secret really to life, this mystery later that is that said hidden for ages and many, many generations, but now it's made manifest, it's made plain, it's out in the open. It's no longer just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles. It's not just for religious people, it's also for irreligious people. It's not just for saints and people who think they're saints, it's also for sinners like me and like you. And it has to do with the incredible work that Jesus did and the empowering work of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. And here's the secret, Paul says, Christ lives in you. Christ is in you. That's the only hope you have to glorify God. That's it. 
And so in many, many ways, we have the secret, but even in churches, people haven't learned to tap in to the secret, to unveil it for themselves and to reveal it to other people. And that is why the Lord gave me this phrase. I crafted it this week. The church and the message of the gospel wasn't meant to be covert, camouflaged, classified, or concealed. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel is of God's unconditional love and forgiveness was never meant to be a secret. West Cobb Church, 24 years ago, God planted this church out of a church in Woodstock to be salt and light into this community, to bring the glorious good news, the best news ever into this community, to help people understand there's a whole lot of places you can put your hope but the only place that you ought to fully put your hope is in Christ. He's your only hope, Christ in you. That's that's all you need. Now, having said that, the word gospel is a word that we use a lot around here. And I had a few people ask me, Pastor, you always say gospel, gospel. The word gospel comes from the original Greek word evangelion. Uh, The word gospel in our day gets kind of junked up, like gospel singers and gospel choirs and gospel music, but the word just means good news. And in Jesus' day, when they used the word gospel, it was someone who was telling good news. And here's the thing about good news. Good news always spreads. Think about it. Good news always spreads. A few years ago, when we heard that the Atlanta Braves were moving closer to uh, this area and they're gonna build a brand new park 11.9 miles from this location, this stage away, uh, chop on. A lot of Braves fans say, this is good news. This is good, I don't have to drive so far. Uh, Ladies, if there was a one cent sale at Town Center Mall or Cumberland Mall and uh, you you went in and everything was one penny, it, it would be good news and you couldn't keep it to yourself. You know you couldn't, ladies. Men, if, if Dick's or Academy or Cabela's had a buy one rod and reel, get one for your pastor, you know, that kind of a deal, or okay, a knife or a gun or you name it and you had that, you would, it would be good news and you couldn't hold it to yourself. If I had discovered If I had discovered the cure to pollen in Atlanta at this time of year, that would be good news, and trust me, it would spread. Good news always spreads. So why do we keep it a secret? And so that's kind of what we're leaning into this week and next. By the way, welcome to Spring Break Sunday at West Cobb. We're glad that many of you came back. We're glad that um, school starts back tomorrow. And um, we're glad that, that in a world of bad news, West Cobb Church, hear this. In a world of bad news, we've got good news. 13 days from today, right here in this place of grace, in the most compelling ways possible, we're gonna talk about the incredible life, the horrible death, the glorious resurrection, of Jesus Christ from the dead, history's greatest mystery, that a dead man came to life. We're gonna give hope to the hopeless, strength to the weak, forgiveness to sinners, and it's all because of the gospel, the good news of God's grace. And our team, best we know how, are gonna share in the most compelling ways possible the message of God's grace. How on the cross, listen, Jesus absolved all of God's wrath for you, 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 and you that he died, and his last words, he declared, it is finished, it's done, it's over. For three days, he was laid, his body, in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, death couldn't keep him down. And Jesus Christ, in the totality of his person, was raised from the dead by the power of God. And from that moment on, everything changed. Some of us know that uh, we hear that everything changed because of Jesus' birth, and in some ways that's true. If you think about it, our calendars were changed, right? From B.C., which means before Christ, to A.D., which means Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So our calendars were changed, but history was revolutionized. The Bible says the whole world was turned upside down because of what God did that first Easter. And we have this news We have the best news ever, that Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins. All the sins in your past, your present, and your future were dealt with. 
We have the hope of heaven when we, when, when we die. We have the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity to guide us and empower us and comfort us and energize us and direct our lives. We, we have this understanding that it's not about me. I hear people say, well, I've tried to live the Christian life. Then you haven't actually lived the Christ life because did you know that you on your own cannot live the Christian life? Literally, Jesus came to live the life you couldn't live. So it's therefore Christ in you. That's your only hope. And I don't know what you're putting your hope in. I know you're hoping that the Braves, you know, go all the way again, again to the, you know, uh, whatever they did last year or get to the World Series or whatever. I don't know if you're putting your hope in uh, Auburn. Oh, that, that's too late. Okay. Um, mm, that hurt. I know. I know. It was a double dribble. What are you going to do? But uh, a lot of people put their hope in the wrong things. Here's the deal. It's no exaggeration to say, if the disciples would have done what most church members do, if they would have kept Jesus and grace a secret, we wouldn't be here today, West Cobb Church. Why, why do we keep it a secret? I think, I think we have some fear. And quite frankly, I'm a pastor and I have a gift of evangelism and I don't share my faith as often as I should. So my goal today is not to guilt you. My goal is to grace you with what Jesus talks about and what the Bible teaches on this. Um, the disciples, they struggle with this. If you think about it, in the early days of his movement, uh, here's Jesus going through the Garden of Gethsemane. And where are his closest followers? They're hardly anywhere to be found. Then there's this one guy who proclaims that he you know, knows what Jesus is really all about, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and all of those things. And he denies Jesus. Peter gets caught cursing and shouting, Jesus? I don't even know who that dude is. And so Jesus dies on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And where are the disciples now? They're hiding out. They're cowering in fear like so many people do. And yet, just a little while, in just a little while, the Holy Spirit of God is gonna descend upon the planet and upon the people. And these cowardly, full of fear disciples are gonna be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and suddenly you see these very same guys going public with their faith on city streets of Jerusalem, preaching and teaching the message that changes human hearts. Really, they had four points to their message. Jesus died because you killed him. He was buried in a grave. God raised him from the dead. Now say you're sorry for the part you played in killing Jesus. That was really their story. These same guys who were hiding out in fear suddenly are so fired up and so pumped up because what happened that first Easter changed everything. And it wasn't because of the teachings of Jesus. It wasn't because of the parables of Jesus. It wasn't because Jesus sat around campfires and sang, they sang, kumbaya, my Lord, while the Lord was still there. It wasn't, it wasn't even because Jesus died on a cross, Golgotha, which was basically a human landfill. And Jesus died a, a, a death of shame on that cross. It was what changed their, their lives was the empty tomb, the empty tomb, the recognition that a, Jesus, Jesus said, he said, I'm gonna do this one day, and they didn't believe him. I'm gonna live the life I'm gonna live. I'm the son of God. The temple's gonna be destroyed, and three days later, it will be raised up, and they didn't even know what he was talking about. And suddenly, as a result of the resurrection and the ability that Jesus had to meet and hang out with his disciples and then 500 other people and go public, and then 40 days later, after he leaves, he sends the Bible uses the word paraclete, another one of the same kind. Jesus sends, God sends the Holy Spirit of God to fill up and fire up and empower these cowardly, fearful disciples to allow Christ to now live his life in and through them by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is so important that we get this, friends, because our mission is the same mission that Jesus has. That's why it's called the great co-mission, Matthew 28 and others. Our mission is to help people meet and love and find and follow this man that we proclaim and we worship. So if that's the case, I wanna take you back for just another moment to my high school dream. There I am and I see one by one guys I played ball with girls I'd met at school and in the senior play, and I see them come to the edge of an abyss, look over and look at me, sadly, getting ready to face their future without hope and without Christ. 
So I wanna ask you a theological question. I don't want you to answer this out loud because I, again, I don't want, you might get it right or wrong, but I don't want you to be proud if you get it right and I want you to be uh, ashamed if you get it wrong. Where do you think people spend their afterlife? Okay, what's our ultimate destiny? I'm gonna give you a multiple choice to make it easier. A, somewhere out in the universe. B, in a state of eternal unconsciousness. C, in some alien life form here on earth. D, in heaven or hell. The correct answer, not according to me, the correct answer according to Jesus where do people spend eternity? Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says, and they will go into one of two places, heaven or hell, forever. Jesus made it unmistakably clear. I wish he'd have muddied it up sometimes, you say. I wish he'd have made it a little more questionable because aren't there many ways to God? No, actually, Jesus says it's black and white. It's heaven or hell. It's sheep from goats. There's no, no middle ground. You will go when it's all over, when all said and done, you will go to one place or the other. And if that's the case, which I believe that it is, I would stake my entire life and ministry and future and eternity on it. I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, if a man can predict his own death and resurrection, which Jesus did, and pull it off, I just go with whatever that man says, okay? So Wes Cobb, if that's the case, there are huge implications to the people that we love and that we know, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our neighbors. Many of them could be one Easter invitation away from discovering the glorious good news of the gospel that until now has been, un, has been veiled to their eyes and they've been blind to it. But now we have an opportunity in front of us. And I wanna ask you to consider students and consider adults. Why does God have me here at this time in the history of our church? As we've gone through West Cobb United, as we get ready for the Easter season, the next 13 to 14 days to maximize the power of Easter. Why has God brought me here at one of the most strategic seasons in the history of the church? Friends, the truth is, we actually believe that what we do here matters for all of eternity. We don't just show up for one hour on Sunday hoping the good will outweigh the bad, trying to change the karma. We don't believe that. We, we don't believe it's a game. We don't, we don't come to church to score brownie points with God. We actually believe that there's a heaven and a hell we actually believe that people go there forever, and we believe, I know, I know it doesn't sound sophisticated, and I know in our tolerant, liberal-minded society, me too, I understand that it doesn't sound right to some people. We believe that Jesus is the only hope. We believe there's many hopes, and people are hoping in many things, but we ultimately believe that Jesus is the only hope this sorry world has. Consequently, we have the most strategic and urgent message possible, the message of God's incredible love and grace, and it ought to wreck us. It ought to bother us like it did when I was a senior in high school. And I've had ups and downs and ebbs and flows when it bothered me more and bothered me less. But when's the last time you cried for lost people who would miss heaven and go to hell? Now, I don't, I don't say this to, to shame you, to shame me, but Easter, Easter's not about the eggs. We're gonna have some eggs for the kids. It's not about the Easter bunnies. It's not even for Jesus. For Jesus, you know what Jesus mostly made it about? Jesus made it about people. There's just something about Jesus. He loved people. People mattered to Jesus. That's why these cards matter. Because when you give a card out, you give it to a person that God loves and hopefully that some of us love. It's got a great reminder. It's got the website, the landing page for all that's gonna happen on Easter. How hard would it be? How risky would it be for us to invite someone that we know. How many, how many of you have heard of these eclectic, kind of weird magicians? They're on TV from time to time. I think they play in Vegas. Pin and Teller. Have you heard of Pin and Teller? Anybody? Pin and Teller? A few of you. Years ago, I saw this, and, and I just, I wanted to, I want you to see this. This is, this is from an atheist named Pin Gillette about proselytizing or sharing faith. Check this out. 
And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. Friends, here's an atheist asking, how much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them how? Quite simply, 13 days from now, we have an opportunity right in front of us. What happened that first Easter changes everything. The life he lived, the death he died, his glorious resurrection from the dead. It's gonna change someone's entire trajectory in this life and in the one to come. It's a game changer. It was for you. Someone loved you enough, prayed for you long enough, and invited you into the kingdom or you wouldn't be here today. I'll say it again, the church and the message of the gospel was never meant to be covert, camoed, classified, or concealed. It was never supposed to be kept a secret, the secret stand. Yes, it's a secret. God says, now I'm gonna unveil it. It's gonna all be out in the open. And he uses this guy named Paul, and here's what he says, the secret, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed to who? The saints, to them, to us. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What is it? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. The New Living Translation. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. The secret to the Christian life is not do these things, follow these commandments, obey these rules, jump through these hoops. The secret to the Christian life is Christ in you. Are you, am I, allowing Christ to reveal himself through us? And if we are, why are we keeping the best news ever a secret? He never intended his disciples to. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor and its power and its potency, what good is it? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill should never be hid. Why are you hiding it under a bushel basket? Shame on you. Why would you do that? There's a song that, when I first heard it, man, it just wrecked me to think that Jesus would, would do this for me and do this for you, do this for us. It talks about the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, that he would leave the 99 to go after me, to go after you. And I want us to sing about that right now.
still blows me away. I don't know why you came to church today. Some of you need to know and others of you need to be reminded. You couldn't earn his love. There's nothing you could do to cause him to love you any more and there's nothing you could do to cause him to love you any less. He just loves you. Oh, how he loves you and me. Not only could you not earn it, you don't deserve it and neither do I. Yet he did it still. Why? Because it's the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless, unconditional love of God demonstrated through his one and only son, Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to be Christ in you, your only hope. My favorite definition of a Christian, you ready? A Christian is someone in whom Christ lives. Is he in you? Is he in you? If he's in you and you've been overwhelmed by his love, you can't keep it a secret any longer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel, the glorious good news of Jesus, how it changes everything. God, those, those disciples were hiding out in fear as a result of the crucifixion, thinking they might be next. God, forgive us when we have fear and rejection in our lives. On the third day, Thank you, God, that you raised up Jesus from the dead by your power and how he lives forevermore to be praying for us, that we would make the most of this life and the one to come. God, would that we would allow your Holy Spirit to so be revealed in us and through us that we would no longer keep it a best kept secret. Help us get out in the open to religious and irreligious people, to saints and sinners alike, the best news ever. And we thank you that you gave it to us because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.